Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another HS2 seminar. My name is Patrick. I'm your host for this evening. Uh, and tonight we will be covering the UC application process. Uh, so I wanted to be able to give you a broad overview and give you some really helpful tips and strategies in terms of what you need to look out for and how to successfully present yourself as a competitive candidate for the UCs. Okay, all right, so uh, let's get to it. Uh, so if you do have any questions for me, I do ask you to put it in the Q&A box, not the chat box, and I will go ahead and answer them at the order that I receive them. Also, uh, at the end of the presentation or seminar for this evening, uh, I will give about five minutes to one of our HS2 students who is uh, going to present a little bit about a project that she has. And so hopefully any of you in the audience, either as parents, if you have kids who are interested in helping her out with her project or as students, if you would like to sign up, you know, I'm, I'm sure you will be uh, in for a treat in terms of finding out about a valuable opportunity for you, okay? All right, so let's get going. So first things first, uh, there is a quick update that just popped up today actually in my newsfeed. Uh, so as you probably know, many schools, including like most of the IVs uh, and schools like MIT and the entire UT system for U University of Texas have included the SAT or the ACT now as part of their admissions requirements. Uh, so no surprise, just a matter of time, I guess, uh, Stanford has now joined the party as well. So as of earlier today, uh, it was reported that Stanford now will require the SAT or ACT again. So, which is, you know, obviously good if you do have a competitive test score. Uh, there's still plenty of time though. Of course, you could use the summer to prepare for the SAT or ACT if you are a rising senior and you do plan to apply to a school like Stanford, okay? Um, now, of course, you know, there could also be certain schools that might announce toward the, the closer toward the application cycle. So if just to be on the safe side, I do highly recommend that people go ahead and prepare for the SAT or ACT uh, while you still have time during the summer. Because if you found out, let's say, for example, in August that some of the schools will require the SAT and you didn't spend enough time to prepare, that could really be detrimental to your chances of getting into these schools. OK. All right. Let's get going. So today, at least, uh, the topic for today is on the UC admissions process. So this is for the University of California, for those of you who are not in California at the moment. Um, so the UC system is, of course, incredibly popular. Uh, now, um, if you do live in California, this represents a tremendous value because the UCs are typically ranked very well in terms of not only overall, I think Berkeley and UCLA are now in the top 15, uh, but they also rank really well for some of the most popular fields like engineering, computer science, business. They're also really strong for pre-med. Uh, and so even if you're outside of California, uh, the UC system represents a pretty good option because not only can you apply to both Berkeley and UCLA using one system application, you could probably also apply to multiple UC campuses that are also pretty strong for what most students want to study these days. Okay. Uh, now, of course, you know, you heard me talk about Stanford, but despite more colleges now requiring SAT and ACT again, uh, the UCs, as far as we know, have not announced anything for the foreseeable future. So there is no change. It's just business as usual. They are still test blind. What that means is that they will not consider your SAT or ACT scores. So there's no point submitting it, basically. Okay. Uh, now, uh, a, a bit of an update. So every single year, the UC campuses are receiving record numbers of applications. So it's getting more and more each year. So that's definitely something to look out for. A fairly recent development, though, in the last year or two is that there's been a slight decrease in the number of applicants and admitted students uh, who are not from California. And... Um, this is no surprise. Uh, if you've lived in California, you probably know that there's some things in the news about California legislators are under increasing pressure uh, and consequently are pressuring the UC campuses to prioritize more in-state applicants. Now, of course, this is kind of like a double-edged sword for the UCs because on the one hand, yes, it's their mission to go ahead and, and accept and, uh, and train more California residents. On the other hand, though, it's a little bit more of a ding to their pocketbooks because um, the, the UCs can charge much more for tuition for out-of-state uh, students. Uh, and so therefore having to allocate more of their spots for, for their freshman class for in-state uh, students does mean that they can forego a little bit more of that out-of-state tuition. So they 
going to have to kind of find a way to make ends meet. So um, at least hopefully for the UCs, that means that the um, California legislature will provide them with more funds to make or offset that difference. OK, now um, now just to kind of let me, you know, though, if you are outside of California, this does not mean that your chances are going to drop dramatically. We're actually going to look at the predicted numbers. So um, this is based on the most recent data over the last three years or so. As you can see, it mostly impacts like four main UC campuses. So you can see like Berkeley, uh, UCLA, the accepted uh, numbers has decreased by a couple of percentage points, not a huge significant amount. Uh, also campuses like San Diego and Irvine are most affected. Santa Barbara and Davis, actually it's probably about the same. So if you are outside of California, that would definitely bode well for you if you're looking at schools like Santa Barbara and Davis. Uh, I think in terms of the actual numbers, uh, let's take a look actually. So um, over the last 20 years or so, there has of course been a dramatic drop in the acceptance rates. So as you can see here, like UC Riverside is the only one that sort of like went against the trend here. So it went up the last 10 years or so, whereas all the other campuses unfortunately here are getting really, really low to the point that UCLA is now looking at like a little under an eight, a 9%, it's like 8.5 or something. Okay, so it is getting much more competitive to get into the, especially the top UCs. So um, I've, uh, since the UCs have not released their admissions uh, rates yet for this year. It normally comes out at the end of the summer, usually around like late July, early August. Um, what we have here is a projection based on how many applicants they had. And I basically used the number of admitted students from last year because the number of admitted students will probably remain sort of the same. So the main variable there is just the number of people who applied. So as you can see here, uh, for UCLA, you're, we're projecting a slight decrease, very, very slight decrease, actually. So only a 0.02% decrease. Whereas for Berkeley, it's actually going to increase a little bit because there were slightly fewer applicants to Berkeley this year. OK, uh, now, not surprisingly here, if you look at the numbers, especially for Berkeley, uh, you'll notice that the out of state, which is the OOS number here, is going to be significantly less than the, the acceptance rate for California applicants. So it's almost half, actually. Right. So Berkeley being the flagship campus of the UC system will naturally probably want to prefer to accept um, in-state California uh, applicants at this point. OK, for UCLA, it's it's not too far apart. Uh, but what you will see here is for the mid four UCs, the numbers are actually much more, there's more, more of a stark contrast here, right? So for UC Irvine, for instance, out of state is at 46% versus 20% for, uh, for California. Uh, I think for UC Davis, it's also pretty large, right? 56% versus 34%. So th those are some pretty substantial like gaps there. So that's definitely something where if you did your research um, and you wanted to apply to some of these other UC campuses, uh, especially because they happen to be really good too for a lot of the more popular majors, you would actually benefit from a significantly higher acceptance rate than what California students are now currently facing. And the reasoning here is, I mean, part of the reasoning is basically because a lot of out-of-state applicants really only know UCLA and Berkeley. So therefore, not as many out-of-state applicants even try to apply for UC Irvine, UC Davis, UC San, San Diego. So it does present a wonderful opportunity if you are from out-of-state because then you could benefit from a slightly higher acceptance rate, even if the trend is for the UCs to gradually decrease the number of spots available for out-of-state applicants, at least in the short term. Over the next two, three, four years, you could still benefit from a higher acceptance rate. Okay. All right. Uh, so for the rest of the UCs, as you'll notice here, um, it's it's pretty much similar, right? There there is a slight favoritism for out of state applicants for Riverside and Santa Cruz, but it's slightly different for UC Merced. And part of the reasoning for this is that UC Merced is the one campus where uh, the UCs have a system called eligibility in the local context where if you're in the top 9% of your graduating high school class, you're guaranteed a spot, a, a spot at a UC. Well, at a UC typically means Merced, okay? So, and that's typically why the numbers are slightly higher there because for some students who maybe didn't get accepted to some other UCs, they might've been guaranteed a spot at Merced, which would account for the higher in-state numbers, okay? All right, moving along. 
So uh, there's some general tips and advice that I want to give you in terms of applying to the UC system. So if you're in California, you're probably very familiar with this. But if you're outside of California, this is probably going to be really helpful in information for you. OK, so first of all, the UC system does have a separate application. Uh, it's, you can't use the common application, which is what you would use for most of your private schools and some out of state public universities. Um, so it's really distinct. OK, that, that means that any information you fill in the Common App does not get seen by the UCs and vice versa, which also means, though, that the essays are separate. So if you've written some UC essays, some of them might be able to be used for the Common App and then vice versa. Right. So there is some sort of benefit to it, but it does mean more work if you do want to try to apply for the UC system. At the end of the day, though, because you can apply to up to nine campuses, it is well worth it. And we highly recommend that any student who is considering applying to California schools should also apply to the UC system. So one distinct difference here uh, for the UC system is that unlike some other schools that do have like early action or early decision, the UC system does not allow for any early enrollment, right? So there's no EA nor ED. Their application filing period, though, is kind of on the early side and is very similar to what some schools might have for their actual EA uh, deadlines. So there is a filing period of a couple of months that starts from October 1st and runs until November 30th. Now, yes, you have until November 30th, but uh, there are a couple of reasons why it actually behooves you to go ahead and send your application earlier. One is that um, the UC admissions readers, the people who actually evaluate your application, can typically start receiving the applications to go ahead and uh, for them to evaluate as early as mid-October. The benefit there is that if they are not as hurried and they don't have as many applications on their, on their docket, uh, they might have a little bit more time to evaluate your application. So it actually does make some strategic sense to send in your application by mid to late October assuming that you actually spent the time to make sure that there are, you know, there are actually good quality essays and your, your application is in good order. Okay. Uh, the other thing too, is that there is a timestamp to all these applications. So sending in your application on November 29th, November 30th does make you come across as a little bit of a procrastinate, a procrastinator. So it's definitely not advisable for you to wait until the last minute. Okay. Um, also key thing to remember here is that unlike the common application, or most other private universities here, uh, the UC system does not require or accept recommendation letters, okay? And as previously mentioned, there are no standardized testing, so it's test blind for the UCs, okay? Okay, so another uh, question that I, I typically ask is how are applications reviewed by the University of California system? So let's take a look. So the UCs rely on something called the 13 factors. Uh, it used to be 14 until they was te went test blind. So there was another thing here about standardized testing. But now we have these 13 factors. So just to kind of go through them, some of them kind of overlap. As you'll probably notice, the first three are largely dealing with your coursework. Uh, eligibility in the local context, I already mentioned that. Uh, that's primarily for in-state students and if you're part of the top 9%. Uh, now, the UCs will not evaluate grades for your senior year. They will, however, evaluate your application based on the quality of the courses that you're taking. So if you had a really good transcript thus far and you decided to take all regular and easy classes by senior year because you didn't think that the UCs evaluated your grades, well, you're right, they don't evaluate the grades, but they will evaluate you based on how rigorous your schedule looks like as well. So if you are primarily hoping to get into a UC campus, it really makes strategic sense for you to still take some rigorous classes for your senior year as well, even if they won't be seeing the grades, okay? Uh, so the rest of these will vary depending on like things like your extracurriculars. Uh, some of them are some out of your control, to be honest, right? So like things like your geographic location, the UCs do want to have at least a little bit of geographic diversity. Uh, I mean, so, some cynical people might say that that's can also, can, that can also be a loophole for the UCs to sort of like bypass any sort of like, you know, so they're not allowed to look at race, but if you were to have geographic diversity based on certain areas, that's one way for them to sort of create more diversity on campus. So I guess that's a good thing, right? Uh, but it sort of works against you if let's say, for example, you're applying to an area where there are a lot of people who are gonna be applying to the UCs because that just means there's also more competition in your area, okay? Uh, next. 
So uh, some UCs, uh, well, most UCs actually use what's called a holistic review system, which means no one factor among those 13 should dominate. And they look at the entirety of your application, right? So just because one facet, like your grades aren't necessarily always great, there's still a chance for other factors in the application process to outweigh or override that. Some, a couple, use what's called a hybrid system, and that would be schools like UC Santa Barbara and UC Merced. Uh, so I'll kind of go into a little bit of detail for each one, and I'll be using Berkeley and Santa Barbara as sort of examples of this. Uh, and then I won't go through every single campus because all the holistic ones would have very similar features and all the hybrid ones would also have very similar features. So for holistic review, what Berkeley does here is they don't assign fixed weights or values, right? So there used to be a time maybe like 20, 30, 40, year, 40 years ago where some UC systems simply used a point system, right? So they would factor into a formula with things like your SAT score, they would factor in your grades and it would turn out a number. And that would be like a clear cut cutoff in terms of like, are you, you know, would they accept you or not, right? So those days are gone, right? So it started with Berkeley using a holistic review system and then it trickled down to the other UCs to the point where now most you know, UC campuses are using the same uh, holistic admission system that Berkeley uses, right? So basically holistic here means no one piece of information is weighted more heavily than others. They try to consider all 13 factors as equally important so this relative ambiguity, though, does allow admissions readers to, you know, have greater freedom in terms of how they select people. So which is why you hear some cases, for instance, where if they really think that there is compelling reasons why some student who maybe didn't get the best grades, but they really love this person's like activities or they have a compelling story or they've had overcome a lot of challenges and adversity, that they could accept those students because the GPA could be one of many factors, right? One of those 13 factors, but not necessarily something that would be overriding, okay? If you were to look at the UC Berkeley uh, webpage, they actually spell out a specific criteria in terms of certain qualities that they look for. Uh, so under their holistic review page, uh, they look for a list of characteristics. And so especially important to Berkeley are feel, things like leadership, leadership ability, character, motivation, insight, tenacity, initiative, originality, intellectual independence, responsibility, maturity, and demonstrated concern for others. Okay, so those are some of the qualities. Now, don't think of this as like a checklist, like, oh, I don't have one of, or two of these, therefore I'm not gonna get accepted. So in general, what you do is you want to showcase in your application uh, elements of these, right? So lean into the things that you do really well. So let's say, for example, you do a lot of community or school service, then having parts of your applications, uh, including the essay showcase, this demonstrated concern for others can make you a little bit more desirable in the eyes of those admissions readers, okay? Um, they also look very heavily in terms of likely contributions to the intellectual and cultural vitality of the campus. So if there are certain activities that you do really well uh, to the point where the UCs could see you as someone who can contribute that ability or that talent or those experiences to their campus, then absolutely that could be a factor that could make you a little bit more, you know, likely to be accepted by those UC campuses, right? So these are all definitely going to be looked at, right? So which is why things like the essays, the activity profile can be very crucial factors that can enable you to, so let's say, override like less than perfect grades, okay? So every single year, HS2 has had success stories of students getting into some pretty good UCs above and beyond what they thought they were capable of in terms of their numbers. And conversely, every single year, you hear stories as well of people who have like, oh, they took every single available AP, uh, perfect GPA, and they have a lot of like different things. But if they cannot articulate it in the application in a way that shows why it's important or show genuine passion for these things, it could be a reason why someone who might be otherwise maybe considered overqualified for a UC campus may not get in, right? So there are always stories of these. So this is why a lot of the qualitative factors, the soft factors, if you will, on the application are in many ways just as important as your transcript, right? So if you know how to use the application right, it could be a powerful tool to put a spotlight on certain aspects of your candidacy that could make you more desirable to these UC campuses, right? All right, so an example of the hybrid methodology here is UC Santa Barbara. So what they say is that they put more weight 
on certain factors, like the number of what's called A through G subject requirements. So these are basically like they itemize the different types of subjects uh, in, in, on your transcript, you know, with letters. All right. So we'll take a look at that in a little bit and what that means. OK, so, of course, the GPA. So in other words, like two out of the three main factors are basically your academics. Right. Uh, personal life accomplishments is another thing here as well, which means could be your activities or did you have like some personal circumstances that they thought was really impressive? Those are the, the main factors. But then they say beyond these three, the UC, uh, UCSB can also consider the 13 factors to contextualize the applicant's qualifications, but there's more weight placed on these three factors, right? So it's a little different from Berkeley's where it's a little bit more evenly spread out, okay? All right, so as you uh, saw me say earlier, Merced uses a very similar methodology to UC Santa Barbara. The rest, you know, for holistic review, it, they're going to be very similar to UC Berkeley. All right, so uh, why are your grades the most important factor? Well, I mean, simply put, if you looked at those same 13 factors we talked about, seven of them, <laughs> seven of them are sort of tied into the courses that you've selected and how you performed in them. Obviously, your actual outright GPA, how you did beyond the minimum course requirements. These are all dealing with courses, improvement in academic performance and outstanding performance. Now, these are not exclusively dealing with their classes though, obviously. Outstanding performance in one or more academic subject areas could overlap a little bit with things like your extracurricular activities. If you have things that you do that are in a certain academic subject area, like if you compete in like biology or math Olympiad, for instance, that could be something that could also count in those categories as well, okay? All right, so the importance of your transcript here. So your A through G coursework takes on a much greater significance since standardized testing is not part of the equation, right? So unlike some other schools where if your GPA wasn't all that great, if you have a really great SAT or ACT score, that could sort of be a countervailing force that basically allows you to be much more competitive than if your GPA wasn't all that great, okay? Uh, so... In terms of the way they evaluate you, this is definitely something that I had spoken to with a former uh, UCLA admissions director, is that the, the system that they look at is they first compare you directly among the students from your own high school, and then the students from your district, and then finally the rest of the applicant pool, right? So it's not like they evaluate you first, you know, as an apples to apples comparison with like a student from a different high school in a different part of the country. Right. So there is like an order in which they evaluate you, actually. OK, so uh, since most students have access to similar courses in the same high school, it's really important to take the most rigorous weighted courses available while still being able to maintain the best possible grades. So, no, you don't always want to take every single available AP if you don't think you can handle it. OK, the other thing, too, is it's not also like they evaluate your application purely from a numerical perspective. Uh, I, the reason I mention this is that for some students, and I've been asked this in prior seminar Q and A's, is that if you took like, let's say a leadership class, or if you wanted to be a TA for one of your senior year um, uh, or junior year even uh, instructors or teachers, uh, will you be penalized because you're not taking a weighted course? No, absolutely not, right? So as long as you're still taking a fairly rigorous course, if you have to take or want to take one or two courses that are not UC weighted credits, you're still fine, right? Because they'll still be evaluating your transcript holistically. So just because you have a classmate who took an honors or AP class in the same uh, in, in the same slot where you were taking, let's say, leadership, does not mean they have an automatic heads up against you know on you or or a leg up on you. I should I should say. Okay. All right. Next is look for opportunities to distinguish yourself from other applicants by showing initiative and in taking additional courses whenever possible. So one of the things you could do is you can also take additional courses at, let's say, your local community college. Or if, let's say, like in the case of HS2, we have a partnership with UC Riverside, you could take UC approved um, courses that could count as part of your general education requirements already, even while you're still in high school. So that could be another way that you can distinguish yourself and make yourself look more competitive compared to other students. 